Actually, my favorite part is it got to explain vaccines. Right, uh, kind of relevant right now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that, no, that's, no, that's good. You know, that's good. good to know. Yeah, no, it is absolutely good stuff to know. And you know, the, phase, the basic principle of vaccines, I think is very, you know, good and noble. Anyway, with that, let's just get started. So we constantly expo we are constantly exposed to the environment. Many of the other life forms we encounter are friendly in nature and actually help us live. For example, without the good bacteria in our gut, we would perish ourselves. However, the outside world also brings danger um, to the human, to the body that can harm us. On a microscopic level, these are often viruses, bacteria, toxins, pollutants, and more. What part of our body creates a boundary to uh, uh, a boundary? that doesn't let foreign substances enter and remember a boundary is a life function of a cellular organism is that is a professor? important life function professor yes can I answer that one yes so it's the mucous membrane and the skin yes it is good job Adolfo. so that's, do we have your, to ask that's you? your answer huh do we have to let you know like when we're if we want to answer it or do we just like say oh uh, you can just uh, we can do a little speedy thing with you guys. We can just take a little game. Whoever's first gets to answer it. Okay. But only one time. So we have 17. It's going to be perfect for okay. the most we get people get to answer today. So this was basically that we are constantly under attack of different things. And the skin and the mucous membranes are the first level of boundary because they don't let this bad stuff come in in the first place. So the, in the mucus, it gets trapped, and in the skin, it just doesn't show up and come in. So that's a good thing. Oh, you guys didn't even see it. Shoot, sorry about that. That's what I was showing. There you go. So that's this slide uh, over here. Sorry, this technology is a little tricky sometimes to me still. Once an invader makes it into the body, we have two main ways of combating it. A specific one in which the body fights a particular pathogen, one that it has previously encountered, and a non-specific one in which the body fends off foreign material more generally. What is the trigger of the non-specific immunity? Inflammatory response. Inflammatory <laughs> response. Good. You, now you have, to, you have to say your name afterwards. Joanna. <laughs> Percy. <laughs> All right, and now, uh, you you come next. So you guys are out for now, y'all and and and, um, and Adolf. Okay. <laughs> so the inflammatory response. I got to change it up here again. I got to use cues for this puppy. Oh, so this is the slide that talks about the specific and the non-specific immunity. And um, uh, specific immunity what, is what we're going to talk about the vaccines. That's when you, in the old days, the kid were going to the neighbor, so we get the chicken pox. So you, you make the body sick, so the body gets trimmed, gets primed, that when a second time the pathogen shows up, you are happy because it can respond much faster. And what this shows here is much more vigorous antibody concentration and time is a much stronger response in the second exposure. And antibodies is what attacks the antigens, which is the, which is the pathogen, basically, for us, which is the bad stuff, and we want to get rid of it. So that's a specific immunity. The non-specific immunity is um, the inflammatory response. So the first line of that is the skin, so it doesn't come in, and then, and then we get into, if the pathogen comes into the body, the inflammatory response is what uh, uh, what helps the body get rid of the bad stuff. So what that basically means, we get vasodilation, which is the blood vessels that are in that area where, where let's say we have a cut, where we have that cut, those blood vessels get more dilated, they get bigger, so they get more, also they more heat. So we bring more blood to the area, it's getting some swelling, it's getting some heat in there, it's getting red, and then leak out red, uh, we leak out, white blood cells and that they they make the area if you're not on on mute put yourself on mute please so one person is not on mute and then um 
with that vasodilation and that leaky capillaries, we get the uh, helpers to come to the area to clean up the problem. So the repair, the neutrophils show up, the monocytes show up, these are white blood cells, also lymphocytes show up, and they travel by this chemotaxis. Remember that word chemotaxis, where the chemicals that are released by the injury uh, are, are bringing the white blood cells towards them. They want to move towards that area. Um, and when you look at this one here, this is, um, well, where are we going to get a little bit more? New, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to say about the repair part, the neutrophils are per present, and you can see that when you get pus in an injury. When you have pus, the green stuff, and you think, oh, that's so icky, you know you have neutrophils that were, you know, protecting you and perish by doing so. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to bring that up. Mm -hmm. So look at that. We got all of that stuff right here. Now, the, uh, the question here is what body signs are caused by vasodilation and the damaged capillary? So that's basically what does the inflammatory response cause in the body? Who's Redness, first? swelling, heat, tenderness. Jessica? Swelling, heat, tenderness. Uh, what else? And the... Uh, what is it? Redness. And redness. Very good. Very good. Okay, so that's right here. So those, we also have then pain. The other one that's there that I didn't mention there is pain, but they are right listed right here. So, so that's a good, um, that's a good, Jessica, that's a good slide to know when you, you know, talk about generally the inflammatory response. And then that triggers the immune system. So let's keep going here. All a cell type that is deadly to invaders is the natural killer cells. The natural killer cells recognize stressed out cells in the absence of their infectious marker. They attack uh, their prey via protein bullets poking holes into the cell membrane, causing them to perish. What protein do they use to perforate the targets? Cesar. Perforins. <laughs> yeah, who is fastest on the, on the button? Um, Perforins, correct. It is. I'm in a class, look, guys. Little. So they have little. They, they poke little holes into the target, and basically, when you kill the boundary and you do That's that it. enough, then the inside and the outside environment mixes together and the cell has to perish and it dies. And so that's a really cool um, cell that we have. We put okay. the so, mm. In order to understand specific um. immunity, uh, 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 mute, in order to understand specific immunity, we should first discuss the major histocompatibility. I shaved my beard again. Mute, mute. Remember the cells. I ain't shaving no mustache. Hello, one person is not on mute. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Um. Hey, Jesus. Hey, Jesus. Oh, I can mute them. Ha! I didn't know that. There we go. <laughs> Poor guy, he didn't know that. Okay, now I can concentrate. Sorry about that. In order to understand specific immunity, we should first discuss the MHC. Remember the glycocalyx of the cell, which is that sugary fuzzy part on the outside of the cell, uh, on a cell surface that helps us with intercellular communication. It's discussed in the cells chapter. Uh, when you need, you need to go back, just go back to that and see it. The MHC is part of the glycocalyx. Normally, it combines with our own protein fragments if a cell is infected, however, it displaces the antigen part of a pathogen. So the ant the, if you have a pathogen, the antigen part, you can think of it being like a flag or a little physical weird looking shapey marker that sticks out of the cell, the pathogen, and is our identifying part for the pathogen. And if we can identify the antigen, we can then know that's a bad cell and we can kill it. And so, um, that uh, this triggers, so this, this bad antigen 
with ours triggers a molecular alarm that mobilizes specific immunity. So these are cells that eat. So there's cells that eat uh, uh, the bad stuff and then display the good and the bad stuff. And we can sort of figure out then, oh, something is wrong. Uh, what happens if the body cannot recognize the cell from non-self? Um, Autoimmune disease, Alice? There you go. Autoimmune disease. I got <laughs> that, Alice. I got it. Okay. That's a good thing. Once you've spoken, you can't anymore. So everybody gets a chance, even though it's a little crazy at first. Maybe I'll figure out a different system, but right now that's what I got. So the autoimmune diseases are here. So you see all that stuff. You have a whole bunch of problems. We have fibromyalgia, we have skin, we have uh, psoriasis, we have RA, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, thyroiditis, a whole bunch of MS is one of those things. A whole bunch of places where the immune system sort of doesn't quite understand what's going on or misreads it, um, and then it causes pathology. And that's very unfortunate, but of course it also shows us how complex the whole thing is. It's a very complex system. <laughs> Now we have some of our cellular heroes. Many are macrophages eat a pathogen, digest it, render it harmless, and then display the antigen together with our MHC on the surface. What does that activate? A specific immunity. Specific immunity. And who's that? Clearly. Hi, you made it. Uh, it's a specific immunity. So those are... These macrophages, we call them the dendritic cells, they uh, antigen presenting cells, they're also called, they eat the bad stuff and then show the bad stuff on their outside. And then the T helper cell says, which is a specific immunity cell says, oh, look at that. There's a problem here. We got to attack that. We got to figure out what to do with that. So that's the interface. These big eaters and macrophages, macro means big, phage means eater. These big eaters are white blood cells that eat bad stuff and then present that on the surface, the antigen part of it. And then we, from that moment on, we call them at antigen presenting cells, APCs, or also they're called dendritic, dendritic cells. Right here, you can see that up here? There it says dendritic cells. And mm -hmm. we had that in the, uh, in, the, in the blood, we talked about that when we talked about the different white blood cell types. So if you need to, unfortunately, I'm so sorry, my, uh, the videos from last week, that the last Wednesday videos didn't process. I'm still working on that. My computer is getting a little shabby. Um, so I had to delete a whole bunch of stuff. So it's gonna, it's gonna happen. If you didn't, if you missed the blood, you're gonna, it, it will come up. All right, number seven, infected macrophages produce signaling proteins that help the proper immune response by producing fevers and such. What are those chemical called, chemicals called? Nobody? Um, Nobody? It's the second one. Cytokines. Cytokines, yes. And who's yeah. it? Carlos. Cytokines. Tum tum. Hmm. So these are signaling proteins. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's basically what they are. So when we talk, we're going to talk about the nerve system. We're going to talk about the hormone system. The hormones are Wednesday. So look at that a little bit. But what we have there is hormones are, are chemicals that travel through the bloodstream and then they get to a cell and depending, um, depending on what the cell surface, what receptor it has, it does something to the cell and has an effect. And then that depends on what hormones it is, uh, what effects it does. So, you know, a growth hormone and all kinds of stuff we have. Um, and we also have a nervous system and the nervous system in some ways works, works very similarly. It also releases chemicals, but it doesn't do that into the bloodstream. It does that at the end of a nerve. So if you have a, if you, if you hit your funny bone, you have, uh, and you feel that nerve firing off, you have at the end of the nerve or the end of the electricity is you're gonna, you're gonna have chemicals that get released by that nerve basically. And then they go to another cell and they have an effect. And so those are long traveling things, either the hormones or the nervous system is where chemicals need to travel through the whole body or a long distance at least. And then we have, we have chemicals that are more locally working. 
and cytokines are some of, of those locally internal working chemicals that, that don't just go through the whole bloodstream, but they go locally from a little nearby cell to a nearby cell. So that's more of a paracrine uh, action. They call that paracrine uh, action when it's not through the whole system, through the whole circulation. So that's that. I just put those there. Those are a co couple of complicated names. But the word cytokine, if you go deeper in medical studies, comes back all the time. And so those are local functioning chemicals, basically. There we go. A little long-winded answer for that. When the body encounters a new pathogen, B and T cells learn to recognize it. This way, when the body is exposed again, it can fight the bad stuff quickly and furiously. Besides learning about pathogens, the B and T cells need to learn of how to recognize self, the MHC. The T cells get schooled in the thymus glands, which sits behind the sternum. Where do the B cells learn the MHC? Chris, um, bone marrow. Bone marrow, yes. I'll give it to, to Chris. You tried twice now. <laughs> uh, both of you guys. Wait. Oh, that's the bone marrow. I know. Mm. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So that's what the name says. T cells, because they learn how to recognize self from non self in the thymus. Mm -hmm. And everything that, it, that they are exposed to after they learn everything from the thymus will be attacked, will be seen as foreign. And so, mm -hmm. you know, some stuff like if you have a, a herniated disc, for example. The inside of the disc, the nucleus pulposus, is an inside gel. The, the, the nerve, the, they've never seen this bone before. And so when then the, the disc breaks and you have the gel squeeze out and you have a disc herniation, that creates a localized inflammatory response because the immune system is sort of attacking the thing because it didn't see it before. It doesn't know what it is, even though it was in our body, but it was always enclosed and it never was exposed to the B and the T cells mm -hmm. before. So that's kind of interesting how that, but the, the name B cell is because they learn their stuff in the bone marrow and the name, oh, in the bone marrow, the T cells is they go to the thymus and they get schooled about self and non-self in the thymus. So that's where they mature, so to speak. Good, so that's for that. Our immune system attacks a specific pathogens in a couple of ways. Some T cells directly shoot an unwanted invader. Others make antibodies, which are those specific proteins that uh, then cling themselves onto the antigen part of the pathogens, rendering that one harmless. This coordinated double attack gets activated, initiated by the T cell type, which is activated when they bind to the MAC fragment on another cell, which is an APC cell, the one that's infected already. Which T cell type am I referring to? T helper cell. T helper cell. T helper. Who are the first? Melissa. Good. The T helpers. So that's why HIV is such a problem because it attacks that T cell stuff. Blah, 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 blah. So actually, I think first the other one. This is. Oh, here, T helper cells, recognize it, um, and then it coordinates it, activate T helper cells, bind to the B cells, um, and then activate the B cells. And so that way they coordinate and, st and stimulate and initiate the immune response. Mm, okay. And then we got the activated T killer cells are kind of like sharpshooters. They hunt down the prey and kill it with protein bullets, which we did before, they're called the perforants. What though do T suppressor cells generally do? Nobody? Anybody? I don't know, diminish the response. All right, there you go. Gail, you're not even on the roster. <laughs> yes, so when the immune response is sort of, uh, needs to be curved so it doesn't get too crazy, the T suppressor cells are the ones that diminish that response. And by cytokines, again, they suppress the B and the T cells activity. And that winds down the immune response. So we don't over overreact. 
So you, it's a challenge. You don't want to, you don't want to underreact, but you also don't want to overreact. And so that's where those come in and hopefully they work at the right time. Wow. wow. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, let's see what we're doing next. B cells are specific to one pathogen. So that's important too. Some B cells that learn to recognize a specific invader stay in the system once an infection is combated. We call them memory B cells because they remember making antibodies to a specific antigen. Their surface is filled with antibodies that recognize a specific antigen again in the future. How do they help the immune reaction once activated? I'm going to keep... Get the microphone open to everybody again who is in the class. Making antibodies. Wait, what? Making I antibodies. Making antibodies. Yeah, and who is this? Uh oh. Say it again. Seriously? Really? There you go. That's what I thought. I recognized your voice, but I wasn't quite sure. And it broke up. The internet broke up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is how they look with all the antibodies on top of it. And um, they basically stay around in the system to then be making antibodies really, really fast. And so when we talk about that, you know, secondary reaction, wait, you can see me? that secondary reaction right in here, that's why we have a, such a furious and fast response. I mean, look at how many antibodies are in the blood. The first response is there, that's all right, but you, you're sick, it takes a few days. Second response comes in like in the vengeance, three times more antibodies or two and a half times more. Um, mm -hmm. and, very, and, and I think they're also, the response is also quicker. It doesn't really show that too well in this timeline here, but it's also quicker. We're moving right along, unless you have a question. Antibodies are globular proteins that can attack themselves to the antigenic part of a pathogen, rendering them harmless. Can you describe some of the mechanisms antibodies use to accomplish that? Choose all that apply. The first one, second, and last. Yes. And that was? Jessica. Jessica. First, second, and last. And that is described. Oh, wait, wait. You can't see that yet. God, I'm doing it wrong again. There you go. So we got antibody antigen complexes when they bind together. So the antibody clings itself to the antigen mm -hmm. and it. It, it neutralizes, it makes the dangerous parts of the bacteria out, it, it covers it so it can't do any harm. It, it, it clumps them together, it, it attacks to a multiple bacterial, multiple pathogens uh, as antigens, and so they, they, they participate out. Oh, and that's the participation right there. So that's those. And then of course, the other thing that's really cool, they can poke a hole in the cell and basically disrupt the inside and the outside of the cell again. And that's, um, you destroy a boundary of a, of a, of a being like that and you, you kill it. You, you destroy the being that way. Mm. So that's very smart too. I know, we are glad to have those things, especially when they work right. But that's why you have all that discussion now about, you know, the vaccine. I mean, not the vaccine, the testing. They test for the pathogen. But then they're also talking about an antibody test, right? And now there's some of them talk about, oh, when you have the antibodies, it doesn't mean you don't get sick anymore. So it, it, the, the, virus, the virus changes so fast. But again, you don't know what you can trust right now in terms of what you hear. So you have to be very careful mm -hmm. of how much we read into certain things. And when you talk about antibody testing, they look at did our blood create those antibodies um, that then we have, we, we know once the body creates the antibodies, we know we have created those plasma cells. So we have the ability to create antibodies fast again and fight that particular virus again. And so that's that. Now the next question is a good one. A body reacts to an invader 
much quicker once it learns to recognize it after an initial encounter. If we can expose the immune system to an antigen without making the body ill, potentially deadly pathogens can become less harmful. This is a brilliance of vaccines, a way or to artificially stimulate our body's own immune cells. We can also give the body immune support passively without activating its own immune system. How is that done artificially, for example? This is Mary Carmen, and by using an anti-venom. That's, yes. Very good. So this is, is a little bit of a tricky one. Well, actually, well, it's just a long wordy one, but um, we're talking about here. So if we give, if we get sick and our body makes antibodies on its own, that's natural immunization, mm -hmm. um, act, natural active immunization. If we get a vaccine and our body gets primed, we're still actively immunizing the cells and make these plasma B cells and make the memory. It's about the memory, create the memory in the immune system. So those are active immunizations. One of them is, is, is natural. The other one is artificial. Uh, mm -hmm. The vaccine is artificial, obviously. And then we can have passive immunity. And so for example, if you are uh, breastfeeding your baby, your breast milk has your antibodies in them and gives them to the baby. And so the baby will be, will be uh, immune against the problem that is around you that you're immune for. That's one reason why breastfeeding is a good thing. Um, but that is passive immunity because the baby's own immune system is not getting activated. It just has fro floating antibodies in itself which is great until the baby, six months plus, the baby can create his own immune system and then the baby can respond to those things on its own, but it gives the baby time to develop that. And then the last one, which was the answer, is when we pa uh, artificially give antibodies to a person. And that's, for example, is when we were bitten by a snake and we can give an anti-venom and inject it and the system reacts fast. We don't have time for a vaccine, if you get bitten by the snake, you have to act fast. And so antivenoms is a way of giving uh, antibodies fast into the system, but you're only giving the body the antibodies and the body does not make its own antibodies to that, to that venom, to that uh, snake poison. Um, and so that's why that is a very good example for that. Do mm. those four differential things make sense? Yes. Good. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Yeah, it's a little tricky, but not really because we just need to understand that the immune system can either be activated and and or or it stays passive and we just help the body with 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 medicine like antibody medicine. Antibodies are great too. We don't have to prime the immune system all the time. We don't expect to get bitten twice by the same snake, I hope. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not so sure about it. Um, in your, or maybe you're in Australia. Did you see those shows about the snake catcher people and all that? Um, anyway, immune cells are dispersed throughout our body in places where we are exposed heavily. The body forms clusters of them within lymphoid organs. Before they migrate to those places, which are secondary lymph nodes, they need to learn to recognize the body's own immune system. Where, wait, we did that before. Did we do that before? Where do T cells learn that? The thymus. The thymus. I got to check that. That's a double question, isn't that? Yeah, no, I got it. I, I don't know. The other one was B cells, not T cells. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I can I, leave I it then. I wrong too, and then I had to go back and double check, and that's how I figured out with thymus. <laughs> okay, well, I'll leave it then. <laughs> Wait, I, I put... I put thymus as the answer and I actually put thymus, bone marrow, and lymph node and got it wrong. Every one individual? Yeah. Well, then it's so, if nobody else got it wrong, it's only the system in, in, the, in the individual. So we have- But it is thymus? Yeah, it should be the thymus. That's why the- Okay. Yeah, that was my first guess, but I was, I was confused. That's one of the two I got wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Again, if there is, 
I've heard it before that there is a couple system things. Mm -hmm. The system is so big and sometimes, I don't know why it makes an error with some of them. And then, but it's not even consistent. That's the thing. It's not like we can switch an, a thing off. Um, who gave me the answer? It was Adolfo. It was, right? I thought so. Yeah. All right. Many lymphocytes reside within lymph nodes embedded inside reticular fiber meshworks. They monitor and, and filter the lymph, which is an interst interstitial body fluid picked up by in the periphery and brought back to the heart. Remember, we talked about the lymph nodes and the lymph vessels a little bit um, in the last Wednesday class. So basically, when the blood seeps into the tissues to give the tissues oxygen, not all liquid comes back into the blood vessels, into the veins. And so some of them have, some of the uh, liquid has to be picked up by, um, by the lymphoid vessels and then the lymph vessels feed that then called lymph through lymph nodes and then that in the lymph nodes it gets filters and then we gonna oh shoot i just said something and then oh i know that's not the answer and then and then from there from the lymph nodes it goes back into the uh, blood system nearby the heart and then the whole lymph becomes part of the blood vessel stuff again the blood again anyway more in the lymph node more vessels feed into the lymph nodes then leaving the lymph nodes. Why do you think that is useful? Is it slowing the flow of lymph? And this is Nadiri. Yes. Hi, Nadiri. Hi. Yes, that is exactly the right answer. So um, when lymph nodes, see, here you go. So the fluid comes in in multiple places, but it gets stuck because it can't escape because there's only one vessel leaving it. And so that slows the flow and that gives these T cells that are sitting in here, these immune cells, time to filter the lymph and make sure all the bad stuff gets taken out. Mm -hmm. And so it's that slowing that um, happens with that. So that's why we, the, the lymph nodes are constructed that way. The spleen is similar to lymph nodes. However, instead of filtering lymph, what does it monitor and filter? Blood. Um, blood. Blood. Who's that? Mary Carmen. Mary Carmen. Okay, good. I know we're a little free for all that. And then last, um, so that's a clear straight up answer, right? And then last question here, what lymphoid tissue do we find in the oral cavity? Tonsils. Tonsils. Correct. You all got that? Everybody got that? Nobody thought they got it and didn't get it? Yes, we got it. Yeah, I got it. That's the only, yeah. because it's a fill in the blank question, so I got to make sure. Yeah. So the tonsils are the stuff they take out of people, right? When they get too many sore throats and things. Right, 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 right. I had mine taken out three times. They grew back, those torn things. <laughs> Can they do that? I guess so. I didn't know that, <laughs> but I did not like it as a kid. Three times under the knife for those darn things, but you know, c'est la vie, huh? That's uh -huh. what they say. All right. Well, how are you guys doing with this material? <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. We didn't really do anything more than that, but I think that's all I feel like we should have to worry about. <laughs>